I want to introduce our speaker. Dr. R.F. Georgi immigrated to the United States from Egypt during high school, I believe, and uh, is a Coptic Christian, so a member of the Christian group, very ancient Christian group from Egypt. He went to University of California, Berkeley for his undergrad and apparently really liked it because he stayed all the way through a PhD in philosophy where he got to discuss wonderful, great questions with a lot of leading thinkers. Uh, his passion, his commitment to the Christian faith never wavered, and I believe that caused a few, what we in philosophy call arguments, which does not mean fistfights, a few good discussions with fellow students and with faculty members at Berkeley. Uh, he has since become a novelist, has authored three novels, uh, The uh, Absolution, an Israeli-Palestinian love story, also the, un the Unbearable Density of Being, and then the uh, book on which today's talk is based, Notes from the Cafe. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Georgie to the stand? Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank, you. thank you, Dr. Loy. It's, I, I have to tell you, it's truly a pleasure uh, to be here uh, on campus. I, I didn't expect this level of audience, but I, it's uh, very encouraging. Um, I recently gave a talk at uh, Fordham University, and um, there were a lot of eager uh, students to ask questions. I'm not going to give so much a lecture, but I'm going to try to have a conversation with you about the digital age that we're in. And I'm actually looking forward to listening from you. That's what I'm looking forward to, not hearing my own voice. Because I think in many ways, everyone here, uh, a student, is probably uh, the foremost authority on the subject that I'm going to talk about, far more than I am. Um, I'm going to start by talking about, um, briefly, about Dostoevsky and his classic work, and how I got to writing my own updated version uh, of Dostoevsky's work. And I'm also going to get into the famous, it's become famous now, The Monk with a Cell Phone Story. Uh, I, wherever I go, I, uh, people ask me about that, actually. Uh, Dostoevsky, Fyodor Dostoevsky, Russian novelist, in 1864, he was an interesting man. Uh, he was penniless. He had a gambling problem. He uh, was sitting on the um, on the deathbed of his wife, um, thinking of something to write. And what he produced was known, uh, became known as Notes from the Underground. And in Notes from Underground, if, I don't know if any of you read it yet, it's a classic work. I read it at least a dozen times. I remember when I first read it in high school, I thought it was the most morose character I've ever witnessed in literature. You have an, the underground man, the character, who's lashing out at the modernity of the 19th century. And he didn't seem to like science, he didn't like technology, he didn't like anything. And I read the book again at Berkeley. I, and I was, at the time, I was pre-med. I embraced science, I'm applying to medical school. And as I read it, I found there might be something here. And I started to take it more seriously. Then I read it again in grad school. And it always stayed with me. Until a few years ago, something happened. Two events happened that made me write an updated version of uh, Notes from the Underground. One was the monk story. My wife, Rose, who's in the audience, uh, were religious, of course. Copts, by the way, are the Christian minority in Egypt, the oldest Christian group in the Middle East. And uh, the Copts were the ones or the group that introduced monasticism to the world. Okay? And um, believe it or not, there is a monastery right outside of Barstow, California, with a church. And my wife one day said, why don't we take the kids and I want to go to the church and the monastery. Okay, fine. We left at six in the morning or something. We got to the monastery. It was packed with cars. So I told my wife, I'll, I'll let you out here with the kids and I'll go find a parking space somewhere. 
So I do that, I park, and I'm walking towards the church. And I must have been just a few yards away from the entrance of the church. And there was, um, looked like a young man, black beard, black robe, and he's walking ahead of me towards the church entrance. And the image I'm going to describe to you and what I witnessed, I want you to pay attention to, because I'm sure many of you may have a comment or two about the monk. Okay? Um, I could be wrong about my own conclusions, right? But what I witnessed was he's walking towards the church, and then I heard a ringing sound. Okay, that's odd. So he reaches into his robe pocket, and he says, yeah, what is it? Notice the language, the irreverence of the language itself. It's as if at the time it was struck by, are you a monk walking into church, or are you entering a board meeting and you're busy? But the language, again, he says, yeah, what is it? And I, and I notice that, and he hangs up fairly quickly, I'm busy, and he walks, he takes off his shoes or slippers, and he walks into the church. And then I started to think, if you understand something about the history of monasticism, the purpose of monastic life as introduced by St. Anthony in Egypt around the third century AD was to leave the materiality of this world behind in order to establish a vertical axis connecting sacred and profane, right? That was the fundamental purpose. It didn't actually start off as being groups of monks. Monasticism started as individuals leaving the world behind. And then over time, it became groups lived together. And the question then I've had ever since that um, monk story was, what is the monk doing with a cell phone? Right? I attempted to talk, the Copts, by the way, have their own pope in, in Egypt, and uh, bishops, so I talked to a few bishops, and they basically ignored me. They said, yeah, yeah, thank you for your concern, but we need to keep up with the, with the modern world. And my response has always been, you can keep up with the modern world in churches, in any other location, but why does it have to be in a monastery where you bring the world wholesale in a box with you. But they didn't listen. Just about a month or two ago, you'll find this story absolutely extraordinary. In probably hundreds of years, who knows, there was a murder in one of the monasteries in Egypt. One of the monks killed an elder monk. Who knows what the reason was? And all of a sudden, the conversation then shifts. Why was there, why were there self smartphones now, right? Why were there smartphones? And why did they have all of the computer connected internet, Facebook, social media, everything at their disposal? And the, the monk who pled guilty to murder simply said, it was too easy. I had some issues with this elder monk, but I figured out how to kill him online. Interesting story, and it was sensation and so on. So this is the monk, and I think for me, I think this captures something about the age that we're living in. Right? People often ask me, are you anti-science, anti-technology? Heavens no. I mean, here's my smartphone. <laughs> It'll probably go off at 11, 18. I am not, right? Uh, are you a neo-Luddite, right? New Luddites are people who are anti-technology. Okay. No, I am not. I think there are many wonderful things about technology and about science and what it affords us. But ask yourself, when was the last time in, um, me, in the media, in literature, right, current literature, have you read something that is critical of the digital revolution that is currently underway versus a celebration of it? I listen to NPR all the time, right? And there are many programs about the latest apps, about the wonderful things, which is great, which is fine. Technology does a lot of wonderful things for us. But there's always 
there's also a time when we have to reflect upon this age that we're living in. Let me read a quote from the book that some of my uh, former students would tell me it's all over the internet. I didn't know that, but anyway. Uh, Information paints no picture, sings no song, and writes no poem. I'm often asked, what did you mean by that? And I'd be a liar if I told you I knew exactly what I meant by it. I had an idea of what I wanted to convey. Part of it is this, is that information itself, knowledge cannot be based on. That there's something about knowledge that transcends its informational matrix, you see. And here is, if any of you are taking philosophy, here's an epistemological question. Is information the same as knowledge? And is knowledge derived somehow from information? Would that count as wisdom? You see? These are fundamental questions because we are inundated by information. We have a near infinite supply of information, but the question is, do we read the same way 20, 30 years ago? Do we have that immersive absorption of text and context and ideas and imagination that we did 20 years ago, right? So if we are overloaded with information, is it always a good thing, okay? That's something to think about. Another aspect of the novel that I, that I decided to write was social media. And you hear of this all the time, social media, and what is it doing to us? I'll give you a quick story. This is the second story that helped me realize I have to update Dostoevsky's Underground Man. And here it is. I walked into, I think it was a Starbucks, three, four years ago. An interesting thing happened. I walk in, and it was packed with people. But then it hit me a few seconds later, it's not that loud. The place, it should be loud. And I place my order, and I go sit down, and I have a book with me, and I'm about to read, and it hits me. Everyone was on a device. Every single person was on a device. People were not interacting. It was smartphone, laptop, iPad, whatever it is. Everyone was on a device. And that's when it hit me, coupled with the Hmong story. What would the underground man have to say about our world today, you see, about this rapid fire, instantaneous, everything instantaneous world today. Social media, for example, here's another question. To what degree do you think as a society, as a civilization, can we have a rich conversation about the world and our place in it? political, social, moral, whatever dimension, the conversation you want it to be, can we have that over Twitter? Can we have that kind of conversation over Facebook? You see? Can you even have it over texting? Right? I mean, I have three children. They finished college. But nobody calls me anymore. They don't call. <laughs> They're texting. Right, they knew I was coming here earlier today, about a half hour before I came. Uh, one of my daughters was in Los Angeles. Good luck with your lecture today. Text. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And so, is social media all bad? No. No, I can't, I can't uh, say that at all. There are a lot of, again, positive aspects of it. But what about the negative aspects? What is it doing to us? Right? And the fundamental question now is, what does it mean to be human in the age of fleeting images, ephemeral ideas, and instantaneous affirmations? To what degree does social media reduce us, Instagram comes to mind, right? Reduce us to narcissists. And do we want to admit it or not? We all want to have this constant affirmations and reaffirmations about who we are based on sometimes trivial things we put online, right? And they said, look at me now. Look at, oh, look, I just woke up this morning. Here I am, right? 
the inane and the mundane become elevated to something beyond what they are. Inane and mundane and trivial, right? I'm going to read you something. Uh, any of you hear of Neil Postman? Neil Postman was the late um, literary critic out of NYU. One of his most famous works was Amusing Ourselves to Death. And Neil Postman framed the television age, right? He died in 2003 at the cusp of the, right? But he framed the visual age, that he called it, right, in terms of George Orwell versus Aldous Huxley, right? Orwell argued that the future, in 1984, right, his novel, that the future will be dark and bleak, totalitarian, controlled, right? You can't think for yourself, so on. Huxley argued something a little bit different. Huxley argued that in the future, we will be distracted from everything that is important, okay? And I just want to read you, and you could sort of, in your mind, think, well, what happened? What panned out? Is it Orwell or was it Huxley? This is from Postman. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban books for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture. You take your pick, or maybe it's a combination of the two. I tend to think that Huxley's prediction came true, that we are becoming uh, constantly distracted. Uh, a few uh, months ago, I was asked, uh, someone asked me if I could help him uh, with calc. I, I love math just as a hobby, you could say. But he wanted help with, with calculus. And he was very grateful. Yes, please, help me. And I used some philosophy to explain a few concepts in calculus. And I couldn't get through 10 minutes with him. 10 minutes. I mean, his phone, and he was very, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. But every few seconds, there was some vibration. There was some, something to distract him. I said, is it possible to turn it off? And he looked horrified at me. What? No, 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 but it's, it's fine. Just ignore it. He asked me to just, but, but I'm trying to have you focus on a concept here, OK? Um, something else about social media to think about is the concept of echo chambers. I'm not sure if any of you heard it framed this way, but echo chambers is simply that we tend, to, many of us tend to go online for viewpoints and perspectives that reinforce our preconceived notions about the world. These preconceived notions could be grand political paradigms about our understanding of the world, or social, or religious, or whatever they might be but you don't get challenged. You, you are inside this chamber that echoes, that amplifies your own view and perspective. And so the question is, we have the technology to allow you to share instantly with people, but are you thinking critically? Are you reflecting on the world? That's something that I think is lacking. And here's something interesting. Faith, faith in the divine. Okay, here's a question, again, philosophical. How do you have and how do you maintain faith in an age where information dominates your cognitive approach to the world? How do you have that? How do you step back and reflect and contemplate? Prayer, in many ways, is an act of reflection and contemplation. But how do you do that when you're running at 100 miles an hour trying to absorb and digest as much information as you can. We somehow think that the more information we get, the more enlightened we become. Think of Plato's cave, right? 2,500 years ago, extraordinary. Plato describes people sitting in a cave chained by their necks and feet. Behind them is someone parading, right, is a fire where someone's parading figures of animal puppets so that they can look straight ahead on the wall in front of them and they can see the shadows of these animals, right? And the reality for them 
right? The culture before them is underpinned by their knowledge of these shadows. And for Plato, that meant what? It meant that these people, right, believe that the shadows, which are two-dimensional, right, that that is reality. Okay? And so, fast forward 2,500 years, we are far more sophisticated than the cave. But then I pose a question. Have we really moved beyond the cave, or are we sitting on the couch, pushing buttons, watching three-dimensional image in color pass before our eyes? Or we're sitting behind a screen, right? And we are absorbing or watching information pass before us, and that becomes maybe our new cave, right? So these are something, uh, some things to consider uh, in terms of faith in, in the digital age. And what does it, finally the grand question is, what does it mean to be human today? Are we thinking, contemplative, reflective agents in the world? Or is it simply about absorbing information? I want to mention something about this school, which Dr. Loy, you mentioned this to me last time I was here, which I think is wonderful. There's something absolutely stunningly extraordinary about Concordia that, that I love. Because a lot of students will ask me, okay, you've made your case. What are some solutions to this? What do we do? We can't go back, right? And look at what Concordia is doing, for one, right? It's offering these extraordinary courses that bring seemingly disparate branches of knowledge together, integrating them together, right? And so here's just some that I've noticed, right? Um, uh, seminars, I think they are. What are truth, goodness, and beauty, math, and philosophy, right? Biology and theology, which is interesting. Who is a virtuous citizen? You mentioned that, right? And generally, what does it mean to be, uh, to be human? Let me go back to this notion of biology and theology. Here's something interesting. Modern neuroscience tells us today that we are nothing more than the sum total of neurochemical activity in the brain. That to me seems to be a little bit disturbing as a human being, right? So you're saying I am reduced to the chemicals, the neurochemical activity in my brain and nothing more, right? So it takes or strips away some of my agency in the world. And if you go back to uh, a few hundred years from Copernicus on to neuroscience today, right? The status of what it means to be human has been gradually chipped and chipped away, right? Uh, Copernicus said we're no longer the center of the universe, right? Geocentric model, fine. Darwin comes along and he says we are the product of organic biological forces over millions of years, fine. Freud comes along and says we are the product of psychic forces, right? Again, you can see that the agency is diminished over time, right? And here's where we are today with neuroscience. We're nothing but neurochemical activity. And so the question of what does it mean to be human also begs the question, how do you reclaim your humanity in the face of the information age or in the face of science today, okay? That's something I think to, to ponder. But as I said, as I started, I actually want to hear much more from you and your perspectives, so I'll open it. So we have an opportunity for questions here. Uh, I'm going to put the mic here. You can come right up to the mic and pose your question. Uh, in addition, give me a couple minutes if you are online to get that up and going. <laughs> and remember, students have to ask the first question, and I'm not afraid of waiting. <laughs> I'm interested more on the, the, the monk story. Hi, um, so I was just curious, I'm actually in like a psych class right now and yeah. how you were talking about we're reduced to like chemicals. Yeah. My question is like that it kind of excites me actually because it's yeah. like the power of what they can do. Yeah. Why is that a bad thing to oh, you? I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that there are a lot of positive things, but you have to grant this idea that the more we can explain or reduce us to chemical properties, right? Uh, I'll pose this question back at you. Where's the agency? Well, you could say, well, the agency is in the chemicals, 
right? And, and you might argue that that's, that's fine, that's a wonderful thing, okay? But to me, the concept of agency seems to have always been, can it go beyond our chemical makeup, our component parts, right? Is there something about us that transcends our component parts? If it is simply reduced to chemicals, if we are reduced to chemicals, we can manipulate these chemicals in our brain, right? Medication, drugs, so on. But to, uh, we can genetically re-engineer them maybe, right? So to what degree, if we allow that line of thinking and that capability, right, to what degree do we preserve or maintain our sense of humanity? Or is our sense of humanity only a function of the time period we're living in? You see what I'm getting at? It's a more of a philosophical observation of the psychology, right? I think you had a follow-up. What? I think you had a follow-up, maybe? Not really. Oh, okay. I didn't fully understand, but that's okay. No, 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 go ahead. Because you were saying you were excited about the chemicals. I mean, tell me why. I think, I think that's a question to ask. I mean, I, th I really like, um, you know, boiling things down and bringing it to the very basics right. and kind of almost like distancing in order to see a big picture in order to jump right back in. Right. So what I like about it is seeing how just brutally honest what we are yeah. and then like indulging in that and like going beyond that. Wherever that leads us. Yeah. Let me, can I make a case for you actually, if you want? Sure. Let me make a case for you. Uh, you know, philosophy for, for many years throughout the 20th century, some of my old professors at Berkeley, right? Professor Dreyfus, Searle, uh, right? there's a philosophy of mind debate. In other words, can you ever get at what the mind is, right? And there's this concept of the ghost in the machine. How do you get at what our minds are if you're trapped in yourself, right? How do you get at that? And I think what you're saying is maybe this avoids that problem by saying distance ourselves, objectively study what the brain is doing, right? But if the brain is nothing but chemicals, here's another philosophical conundrum, right? Is there a soul? If there's nothing but neurochemical activity in the brain, what happens when the brain is dead but survives? Well, if it's just chemicals, right? The line of thinking was, well, nothing survives, you see? But if something survives, if you have this faith, you embrace this idea that something does survive, then where is it located? Is it locatable within this neurochemical matrix, right? And I think that psychology has its own inherent limitations, just as philosophy does. Other questions? Ah. Hi, this is more of a, a comment than a, um, a question yeah. because you stated that uh, faith is less because of the information uh, technology, but I would argue the opposite. It's just that it's not Christian. So the faith has actually spread with a lot of uh, esoteric practices because my background is yoga. And so with, and you only have to look in Southern California, the, the spread of yoga, that, that faith is actually uh, spread, but it's changed and that it's the, the, the church which is struggling with the change? Yep, that's, that's a very good uh, question. Is faith less, or is it, I think what you're saying is, is it transformed, it's some, yes. right? Yes, yes. Tr is it transformed? Yeah, I'm not sure, I mean, it could be. You might be very well correct. It could be being transformed. I have a, a Muslim friend who's religious, and from Egypt, right? Ma the majority religion in Egypt is Islam. And he, you know, is required to pray five times a day. But then, you know, we had this conversation uh, and where he laments and complains, you know, how do I just take time off, disconnect to, to pray? You see what I mean? And so I think the intrusion, what I'm talking about, there's this constant, right, intrusion into our lives in terms of technology, distractions, okay? And let me pose this question back at you. Do you think we do more reflection today or less in terms of previous generations? As I'm your generation, uh, I'd say less, definitely, because yeah. I've experienced both. I've yeah. experienced now right. and 20 years ago. But, but isn't reflection important to faith, you think? Oh, it's totally, yeah. very, very important. But then uh, the way I see, because I see what's happening at the moment is, is just a process of change. So we're in the midst of the change rather than the outcome. I absolutely agree with you. Mm. This, I don't know the answer. What do you suspect, everybody here probably has their own answer, mm. what do you suspect this process of change is gonna to lead towards? What do you think? 
well, it's obviously something new, yeah. and uh, and with technology, it, you normally have to, it's like anything, you have the crash and burn. So right. you use it until something happens, you get sick, and then you reflect, and then uh, change. But uh, because most people won't change, they have to have some sort of uh, crash or uncomfortable circumstance to change. Right. So, and that hasn't really developed yet with the use of technology. Yeah. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. I think part of me hopes. You know what part of me hopes? Part of me hopes that, because part of me loves technology, that technology would sort of take a back seat. We know it's there. We know it's sophisticated. We're not enamored with it anymore in terms of our fancy gadgets, right? We've gone through that phase, okay? And then that creative impulse that we have to, to engage ideas emerges better and stronger than at any other period in history, mm. right? I think there's a potential to do that, that this kind of convergence, right? We spend time, it's like, you know, Googling something constantly, or Wikipedia, or we're gathering all of this information. We cannot possibly absorb a fraction of it, right? I had a student of mine many, many years ago, he teaches now at Cal State Fullerton, and, and one of the things he told me was, I, I don't have your knowledge base. I said, what knowledge base? You can always, you need to learn to teach your students how to think and then supplement, right? As you get older and as you read more, you're gonna supplement your knowledge, okay? We need more critical thinking, more reflection, and I think this is one of the things I love about what Concordia is doing with the classes they have, okay? Is that it, it, they integrate knowledge and ideas. And in that sense, if this is a change that you're talking about, I think it's a wonderful change, hopefully, and I absolutely embrace it. But if we continue on a path of less reflection, less contemplation, I don't have time for this, right? I mean, you are students, ask yourself this, isn't, how easy is it for you, if you have a writing assignment to do, right? To find cursory information on it online, slap it together any way that you could, there, I did it. To what degree do you engage seriously on the topic itself? Sorry, and the other comment Absolutely. I'd add to that was to care, because I come, I'm from Australia where 96% of people vote, okay? And you have a different society because people actually, you know, we actually get fined if you don't vote, but the outcome is you have a society that has a lot more caring in it because people actually have to choose. Oh, I love the, thank you. I love the way you framed that. But you know what's interesting? I was in my country in Egypt uh, not long ago, a few months ago, and... It seemed it was, I mean, everybody in Egypt had a phone glued to themselves. I mean, they were just walking in the street, watch where you're going, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm walking in the street and everybody had a, a cell phone with them and it's constant use, okay? And I think that what I'm talking about is not so much trapped by culture, but it has spread, it is a global phenomenon. That's why I use the term age. It is the age that we're, we're living in. And I think what, where we go from here is gonna depend on what, our input, and it's gonna depend on the young people in the audience here. It truly is gonna depend on you, what you wanna get out of this technology. Thank you, thank you. Faculty and staff, you can come up now too. Hi, so I was really interested by that story you told at the beginning about like uh, the monk with the cell phone. Yeah. So my question would be, uh, do you think it's possible to live like that lifestyle like a, in an isolation from the world? in the digital age? Wow, that, that's an absolutely profound question. Um, I think that see, being a monk is not an easy thing. And I think if you look at the history of monasticism, right, uh, there are certain individuals who wanted to leave the world behind and simply, regardless of what century you're in, that's what they wanted to do, to commune with, with God, right? Um, and if, if that's what you wanna do, I think that in the digital age, is it possible? Yes, it is possible. But I think that you can't be, as an institution now, I'm talking about the monasticism, you can't lie to yourself and think, listen, we need to be current in the age that we need to know what's happening in the world, right? And my response that has always been, you could certainly be current about what's happening in the world by being in church, by being a priest, by being anywhere else. But you either, you either preserve the monastic tradition or fundamentally change it, right? But acknowledge the change. See, the monastic church in wanted to acknowledge, we are removed from the world, really? 
but you're bringing it, like I said, wholesale in a box. To what degree are you preserving the monastic tradition, you see? And I think that's the problem with the image I had with someone dressed in a black robe, picking up the phone. Did you notice the language? I wasn't exactly, I used the language exactly what he said. Did you notice the irreverent language? Yeah, what is it? I mean, why not to, okay, yeah, dude, what's up? What, what's going on? No, 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 I gotta go, to, I gotta go, I gotta get going. Okay, yeah, I'll talk to you later. Do you see that kind of, what would be wrong in that, with that language, right? There's reverence, part of the monastic, there's a certain reverence, right, with it. And I think that's the problem. Now, in the abstract, could you say, could, can you pull it off? In the, yeah, I think you could pull it off. Absolutely. Something that's what you wanted to do, is remove yourself from the world. Uh, hi there. Um, do you think this uh, advancement of technology, is it a movement of transhumanism? I'm sorry, and I didn't hear the last part. Transhumanism? Transhumanism? Yes. Uh, define that for me. Ooh, Dr. Ash. <laughs> um, <laughs> Are, are you saying that it will bring, bridge people together, you know, in, in beyond borders, culture, blah, blah? Um, not exactly. Okay, sorry. Downloading your consciousness ah, ah, ah. to a hard drive sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, Black Mirror, um, Black Mirror, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So w what do you think about that? I, I mean, I wouldn't laugh. It's not, it's not science fiction. I think that it's something. There are people actively working on that, by the way you know, this concept of uh, downloading your consciousness. But then it goes to the question, again, the philosophical question, what is consciousness, okay? Is consciousness neurochemical activity, and that's it? And if, if the answer is yes, right, then we can do a great deal of many things with that, right? Manipulate it, download it, upload it. Do you see what I mean? If it is that. But if consciousness defies such a reductionist approach that who we are, our sense of identity, our sense of self, right, cannot be reduced to that, it, 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 it might be difficult to simply download or upload it, you see? So a lot of it is going to be predicated on our view and how we approach consciousness itself or mind, okay? I mean, Descartes did a lot of work in this area, by the way, right, mind-body problem. If you've seen such movies as The Matrix, right? Um, is the mind something separate and removed from the body, right? And, and so these are philosophical questions, but they also intertwine and intersect with technological questions now, you see? And I think it makes it quite interesting. A quick question, you notice I ask questions back at, at people. Um, do you think that that is possible or would it be something that you would look forward to? It's a kind of a form of immortality, right, or approach to it. Yeah. What do you think? You asked, if, you asked if I think it's possible? Yeah. And do you look, would you look forward to it? Would, would I personally look forward to it? Yeah. Um, I don't think I would personally look forward to it. Do I think it's possible? I think yes. I, I, think, I think it could be possible, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah. It's I think enticing. the idea of embodiment yeah, I know. is Isn't very, very important. It's like, yeah, what an idea. But thank you for that. Would you agree, yes. as you mentioned, that um, we receive a lot of information thrown at us on a daily basis, would you agree that it's gradually chipping away at our ability to like, make connections and be able to decipher what truth really is, like what is real and what is not? So, but could you go back to the first part of the question about information? Um, yeah, you mentioned that constantly we have a large quantity of information oh, yeah. being yeah. thrown at us. Right. And do I think... Yeah, is it like eroding our ability to be able to decipher what truth is and what is real oh, wow. and what is not? Yeah, well, you cut to the chase. This is the heart of the philosophical question. Do I think if it erodes it, right? Mm -hmm. That possibility. I think having... This much information, right? I guess I said, it, it is impossible for any individual to absorb a fraction of it, right? And I think that, where's the Australian gentleman who was asked earlier? But, but I think that you could argue that in time, and I'm, I'm being optimistic and hopeful here, that in time, uh, maybe it's not so much about how much information, right, that you have, 
but what you do with the small amount that you could absorb, you know, to be creative, a creative agent in the world. But as of now, if I think that it is eroding this sort of search or, or assessment of truth, absolutely. Yes, I think it is eroding it. I think that we are on this kind of stage where we are enamored by how much information we have, right? And I, I fall victim to this as well. I mean, whenever I hear something I haven't heard before, what's my knee-jerk reaction? And I wrote this book, right? <laughs> uh, let, me, let me get on Google, right? I'm gonna Google this, okay? But then sometimes there is so much information and then 15, 20 minutes and I'm reading into, whew, I'm tired, I got other things to do, right? There is a great deal of information. And in the abstract, I think culture, it's great to have a lot of information, but there's, there's a kind of dissonance, right? There's a kind of asymmetry between the amount of information we, you have, right, and our inability as a culture to critically think about it. And you would think that they should go hand in hand, right? And I'm not talking about people in Concordia. I mean, you're, you know, you are critical thinkers, but I'm talking about culture at large, right? And the trivial aspect of culture and the trivial aspect of social media that's everywhere, that dominates, right? And I think that's a little scary. Yeah, how can you avoid like staying on the right path of like critical thinking and not getting like lost in the sauce? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I think one way to avoid that, I think, for example, is reading texts and not skimming information. You see what I mean? Because when we read text, philosophers, writers, right? When you have this intimate experience with a text and you're absorbing what the text is telling you and you're thinking about it, you're reflecting upon the world, right, given that text. We need to do much more of that. And people ask me, do you prefer the physical or could you read online? Okay, well, I mean, I don't think that for me that's a huge deal. I'm of a different generation, obviously. I like to hold and feel the book. But it doesn't matter if you even read it, right, online or you read it on an on a iPad or whatever. As long as you are reading and absorbing, not skimming for information. See, that's the problem. And I think having rich conversations, but what do we do? We resort, doesn't Twitter make our life easier in terms of you're, you're gonna lash out at someone and is it 280 characters now, <laughs> right? It went from 140, but you're gonna lash out, you're gonna humiliate someone in so many characters, right? You're gonna make your point, ad hominem attacks, attack the person, right? And, and the idea, right, the, the, the discourse itself be damned. Ad hominem attacks, yes. Critical discussion, no, who has time for that? And I think in that respect, it's, it's, it's not good. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a question from online from yeah. Mark in Irvine. Yeah. You painted a picture of a continuum of agency or ownership to describe how and why we interact. Do you think the current culture forces a choice of how we use our ever-expanding interaction tool set and, therefore, may in fact represent a greater opportunity for choosing ownership instead of defaulting into it? And that's all I've got. Yeah, no, that, that's a very enlightened question, actually. I think, I'm not sure if I would agree that culture imposes, I mean, it, it, it imposes technology, in a sense, imposes upon us right, means of interaction, okay? I didn't have to buy an iPhone, okay? Um, but I liked some of the features, okay? And these types of phones are ubiquitous. Could I have refrained? Yes, I could have refrained, right? I could have not had a phone altogether or had a simple, simple you know, um, cell phone. Uh, does it give us choices or limit I think, what was it, David? Limit our choices, right? It's, it's fine. It's choices, uh, in particular, interaction tool set for ownership of... Well, it does, it does give us choices, absolutely, right? And, and what do we call it, platforms? We have a host of platforms by which we can interact with the world, right, and with each other, okay? My question is, let's say you had, you had five choices in the past and you have a 1,000 today, okay? Let's grant that. On the surface, that seems to be a wonderful thing, but then my philosophical question is, what is the quality of that interaction? I remember growing up, 
in Egypt. My grandmother, I think, had a third or fourth grade education. But she had unbelievable wisdom and narratives and story and oral tradition, right? That you, that you don't have as much today, okay? And I think that how we do it, the quality of our interaction today, I think, is affected. It's not always about how much. I mean, one could argue, look, we're liberated, right? We've moved beyond Plato's cave, okay? We're far more advanced today. And I question that assessment. To what degree have we moved beyond Plato's cave? The shadows today have become far more sophisticated. Hello, thank you for that. Um, thank you. I got a, a question that I'm gonna frame in this way. It's kind of sure. a challenge. Uh, yeah. In environmental philosophy, one of the problems that one faces is, a, is the problem of shifting baselines, yeah. right? So if you got fish that are declining, you're like what population do we wanna get back to, right? And I'm curious if one could do an anal kind of an analogy with what you're discussing in, term discussing in terms of technology and agency and technology and, and our communities. You've pointed back, you've made claims like, oh, well, even 20 years ago, like people were better critical thinkers. I don't think so, Yeah. <laughs> right? So can you point to a time in history where it all gelled? Like, what's our baseline? Where's, where's the thing we should look back to to be like, that was the golden age? And if that's not possible, then what is the route forward? Yeah. Uh, I disagree. I mean, we disagree. I, th I think... I'm, I'm by no means claiming that it was the golden age, far from it. I, I'm, I am saying it was better quality. And try to read articles that he just published, forget scholarly work, published in newspapers, and compare the style of writing to a, style, to the, to a similar topic written 20, 30 years ago. I've done that. I've done this comparison. I thought it was in my imagination, right? And, and, and the level of, of engagement of the topic went beyond the cursory. Today, how often do you read articles today and you have the, the, the what do you call this, the picture of the Twitter, the tweet, right? And, um, and so the person writing is telling you what the tweet is saying and then they have the picture of the tweet. And that's supposed to be, that's the new standard. I never understood that. And it's all surface, but if Twitter is, is 280 characters, whatever characters it is, right? Imagine the article that you're reading. What is it doing? It's simply saying, look, we're going to accept this format of critical engagement. Now go back. You're the one that asked the question, right? Go back. Go back 30 years ago. Do you see any of that? Yeah, because you made, that, you made the claim that you disagreed, and I'm just wondering. No. You could be I, right. No, I, I mean. But, and by the way, I didn't, I didn't claim that it was golden. Right. Far from it. All right. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just raising the, the problem of the shifting baselines. I, I, would, I would go back to the medieval university with like, you know, let's get rid of that building and let's put up a castle. Yeah. I mean, that's what I would do. Yeah. But I, I've been very conscious of the fact that baselines do shift. Sure. And that going back that is not going to solve the problem. Oh, no. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. I'm not suggesting that we go back, you know, and you can't, even if I was, right? But what I am suggesting is that we don't bury the past also. That the past, the, the, the level of conversation in the past could guide us to how we, not go back to it, but how we, remember I said earlier that technology should take a back seat. We know it's there. We know what it can do. But maybe we could start again having these critical, reflective, contemplative conversations that are informed by literature, that are informed by philosophical suppositions and assumptions, not go back to some baseline. I, I totally agree with you. So your thoughts on online education? Um, so what was, I didn't hear that. <laughs> what did he say, David? He said, I totally agree with you. Now what are your thoughts on online oh, education? Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> I've seen many, believe me, I, I, I've seen many platforms, and I think that at the moment, I mean, they're better now than they were five, six years ago. They're better now than they are 10 years ago. Uh, and I think that technology, this is one area where I think technology can help us, where we could have these uh, vir real-time virtual discussions that are, that are serious, right? And it's, it's engagement of ideas, right? But it's not about a checklist of do this, do this, and do that. Here's your online course. You see what I mean? Can I sneak something in when you mention online? 
Could whoever in the audience here, could you raise your hand if you ever sat through a, um, a, what you, a PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. As I am. Uh, I've had to several uh, online presentations. One, can I tell you, maybe, I hope some professors don't get upset with me because uh, I'm not criticizing them at all. Uh, I've sat through online presentations and uh, the person has whatever, click a button and the slides are moving, right? And here's the one thing I didn't appreciate about technology. They're reading what's on the slide. And then they're clicking next. And, and you, if you're a student, right, you don't want to be, you, you don't want to say anything. Like, okay, I got to know this. And they're doing it. And then part of your voice is probably saying, what the hell am I doing here? I mean, I see what you're doing. I can do that. I can go through the online presentation myself, right? And, I, and I've been through several that were not enlightening. And there was over-dependence on the technology. Yes, it would be wonderful if you have a slide, but you add a great deal of meat and substance to the slide is simply summarizing, right? Please join me in thanking Dr. George. Thank you. Thank you.